welcome uh, to the FII View, a special show where we profile prominent fund managers, uh, veteran fund managers, uh, to talk about uh, the global market situation. Uh, joining me on the show today is Mr. Arjun Devecha, a man who needs no introduction. He's the chairman of GMO, oversees $15 billion worth of emerging market assets and has been in the business for more than 20 years. Mr. Devecha, thanks very much for yes. taking out the time and speaking with us. Uh, GMO has uh, constantly in its reports highlighted the fact uh, that uh, you know growth as well versus stock market returns are not correlated. Could you explain that? Because it seems like right now global money is chasing growth. That's true. Although I'd say global money is chasing yield because it seems yields in you know in the developed world and pretty much everywhere are so low. So I'd say they're chasing yield. But to get back to your original question, yes, we believe in the data pretty much supports that. The fact that there is no linkage historically between GDP growth and stock market returns. Now, the reasons I think are many. One of them is the fact that people already pay up for growth. So the fact is that the countries that are growing faster, typically when you buy into them, already have P-E ratios or valuations that are already high. So therefore, in some sense, it's already baked into the price. Mm -hmm. So that's one part of it. And then the other part, I believe, is that the way that countries grow faster than others, so China is a good example, is through investment. So if you think of the components of GDP growth, which is government investment um, and uh, consumption, typically the countries that grow very fast, grow fast because of investment. Okay? So the likelihood is in those countries, investment is very high, like in China. And if there's one thing we know about capitalism, it's that overinvestment leads to low return on capital. Underinvestment leads to high return on capital. So in some sense, the countries which have been underinvesting, like India or Brazil, mm -hmm. have had historically higher stock market returns okay. than countries like China, which have overinvested. But then how do you explain the attraction there is for emerging markets where the buzzword is growth? It's logical to think that there should be a connection, right? I mean, yeah. it just makes sense that there should be. It's just that historically there hasn't been. Okay. So I can't say that in the future there won't be a connection. All I'm mm -hmm. saying is that historically there's no evidence that there is such a connection. If it's not growth in emerging markets, sure. then what is it that draws you to the region? Typically, it's not the region per se, it's the specific countries and stocks. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that we're value investors, we like to buy stuff that's cheap. So the attraction is when you can buy things that are cheap. The nice thing about emerging markets is there's a pretty big disparity between the cheap stuff and the expensive stuff. Mm -hmm. So right now, if you look at something like Russian energy companies, they're trading at four times earnings and paying a 5% dividend yield mm -hmm. versus, say, you know, some more expensive you know, um, you know, consumer stocks uh, you know, in India, for instance, which are trading at 30 or 35 times earnings. Mm -hmm. So our view is basically that you, know, you make money by buying the cheap stuff. What's the kind of return expectation that you have uh, when you invest uh, um, at, at a cheaper price? So in some sense, you could think of the return expectation as being the inverse of the P-E ratio. Mm -hmm. That is, if P-E is 10, mm -hmm. you should expect at some level to make 10% a year on your money, you know, in normal mm -hmm. terms, so, or in real terms, really. So at some level, that's what it is. So the cheaper you buy stuff, the greater the expectation. So if you buy something which is trading at five times earnings, you know, you should expect to make 20 plus per year, you know, return on it. At GMO, you focus a lot on asset allocation. Yep. You know, given the volatility that we're seeing across asset classes right now, uh, what would be uh, a, a model that you would perhaps propagate uh, to allocate money across assets? Sure. So we have a consistent way of doing this. We've been doing this now for over 20 years. So we have an asset allocation model for deciding which asset classes are attractive. So the model basically has three components to it. One is what do you pay? That what's the P-E ratio? And the idea is that an asset class say US equities, should trade in the long run at say 15 times earnings. So if right now US equities are trading at 18 times earnings, you're going to lose that, in going from 18 times to 15 times, you lose a certain amount of money. So there's an expectation from that. The second piece is the actual earnings growth that occurs over that period. And third is the dividends that you collect along the way. So your return expectation is the sum of the three. What happens to valuations? What happens to earnings? What happens to dividends? So the idea is that you have to make a reasonable expectation for each of these. Mm. And our basic view on all of them is that there is reversion to the mean. That is, if in the long run the U.S. equities have traded at 15 times earnings, mm. they will go back to 15 times earnings. If the earnings growth has typically been 7 or 8 percent or the margins have been a certain amount, the margins will revert to normal. So at the end of the day, the most important factors are valuation mm. and margins that they will revert to their long-term means. Mm -hmm. So if you say, if you go from now to their long-term means, how much money do you make or lose? Mm -hmm. So based on that, we come up with a forecast mm -hmm. for each, every single country, or I mean for every 
things like U.S. equities, emerging equities. So right now, emerging equities are perhaps the most attractive from an expectation point of view, mm -hmm. where we expect them to deliver over the next seven years mm -hmm. approximately 6% in real terms, in real dollar terms. <clears throat> Versus the U.S., we think you make 0% because we think they're expensive. What are your top bets right now? So right now, we think that most equities are actually quite expensive, mm -hmm. and we think all bonds are toxic. <laughs> So we have, uh, so we're actually holding in our asset allocation portfolios where we allocate money for mm. our clients, mm. we actually have a lot of cash. We have 30, 40% cash. Okay. In some form of enhanced cash would get some extra return and things like that, but, mm. but basically it's cash. Mm. So we have, uh, in some sense, a barbell within equities. We have a lot of U.S. high quality names. Mm. So within the U.S. market, we don't think the overall market is particularly attractive, okay. but we think that the high quality sector, that is big cap, branded kind of companies, mm. we think are actually pretty attractive from a valuation point of view right now. Mm. So we have a fairly big bet on that, mm. and we have a fairly decent sized bet on emerging equities, because again, they're relatively cheap. Mm. So emerging equities are trading at 12 or 13 times earnings, mm. so they're moderately cheap. What about currencies and commodities? What's the focus there? We tend not to have huge bets on currencies or commodities. We don't really have strong views on these. Mm. So right now, we don't have any specifically large bets on currencies or commodities. So while you're sitting on higher cash levels at this point in time, what do you make of the so-called safe haven investments, which are typically used to de-risk portfolios, That's whether it's a U.S. dollar, U.S. treasuries, uh, gold for that matter, which saw a significant slide sure. uh, a few weeks back? So let's talk about gold, actually. Yeah. I, I, we actually have an interesting theory about gold. Uh, our theory about gold is that everybody focuses on gold from the point of view of a safety asset, from the point of view of um, you know, central banks mm -hmm. and ETFs and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. But really, when you study the data, what you find mm -hmm. is that 70 to 80 percent of all gold demand in the last 10 years mm -hmm. has been consumers in India and China. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, it's really the state of the economy in India and China that drives gold. So we think that to a large extent what has caused the gold price to fall over the last year mm -hmm. has really been the drop off in demand in places like India and China because essentially both these economies have slowed. You know, the, the funny thing is that at the initial stages of the slowing of the economy, when people are worried, they buy more gold because they see it as safety. Yeah. But then eventually the wealth effect kicks in and if people don't have, if they're not earning money to buy the gold, so that's why we think that the demand has dropped off quite significantly, mm -hmm. and we think that's really what has driven the price of gold. Mm -hmm. So in short, we have kind of a very radical view, which is that we think that gold, rather than being counter-cyclical, mm -hmm. has now become pro-cyclical because it's now tied to the econ economic growth of India and China. Mr. Devesha, let's talk about what's happening in the Western world right now. The markets on balance have been outperforming. That was the case in 2012 and year to date as well. The U.S. markets have done really well. What's mm -hmm. happening there? Well, I have to say I'm perplexed. I mean, certainly valuations are quite high. We don't think that, you know, it's, it's not clear to me what's really happening there. I mean, I, I, don't have a good, I don't have a good explanation for why the markets are going up. And especially the fact that emerging markets have not been participating mm -hmm. in this rally. So you would have thought that if you had that kind of a rally in the U.S., mm. that you think that emerging would be kind of a high beta mm. to that. But that hasn't been the case. I have to say I'm perplexed by that. I understand why emerging markets are not doing well. Yeah. I don't understand why the U.S. is doing well. Would you think uh, there's something that the market is picking up about the economy that we haven't as, uh, as yet read into? Well, it does seem like certainly the U.S. economy has been surprising on the upside, you know, for the last year, that basically... Growth, again, it's, growth is not high, mm. but certainly things are a little bit, little bit, little bit better, mm. you know, over the last year. So therefore, I think that to some extent, perhaps the U.S. market is surprised by that. Oh, is it the case that uh, U.S. equities were really cheap? There was a lot of money in U.S. bonds, and now there's just some, um, uh, you know, rebalancing happening there. Perhaps. I mean, part of the problem is that, you know, bonds are not attractive because yields are really low and sooner or later you will have inflation, you will have interest rates going up. Mm -hmm. So the fact is that you have a lot of liquidity, the money has to go somewhere. But what about the problem in the U.S. economy? Where do you think the U.S. economy is at this stage? I mean, the economy is, you know, I mean, one of our views is that the economy is never really going to grow at the three, four, three or four percent levels that it grew at for the last hundred years. Mm -hmm. That is essentially because of the demographic changes that have been occurring you essentially have a situation, and this is even more true for Japan and Europe, but certainly in the U.S., we don't think that you could grow at more than 1.2, 1.5% a year kind of in the long run. Mm. 
-hmm. because the demographics profile has been changed. So the average growth, long-term growth for the U.S. is sub 2%, you think? We believe so, yes. Okay. Uh, what about Europe? Uh, how do you see the situation panning out there? Because over there also, you know, uh, uh, it's been very individual with market performances. Uh, Germany has done extremely well. It continues to do well. There was a call about taking a contrarian position on Italy and Spain uh, purely from a value perspective because mm -hmm. they were so oversold. Mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't quite played out. There's still a lot of concern in Europe. Sure. I think that Europe's problems are by no means even close to being over. I mean, you know, this is not even the end of the beginning, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think Europe has some significant problems. And even if they deal with the short term problems of the euro and things like that, mm -hmm. they still have the demographic issues and, you know, all the other problems that they will have to face up to. Mm -hmm. However, at the end of the day, you know, certainly for a while last year and even now to some extent, some European stocks are cheap because they've become, you know, because the prices have fallen sufficiently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so we do find some value over there. So you don't agree with uh, a comment coming in from uh, uh, Noriel Rubini saying that the risks in Europe has, uh, have significantly reduced. As a money manager, how well, does that influence your decision? It, it has reduced in that what you've seen is that the system and the ECB in particular has been shown a willingness to monetize the debt, mm -hmm. which historically they were said they would never do. Mm -hmm. So from that point of view, you know, what Draghi said was that, you know, we will, you know, we will make sure that the things do not fall apart, i.e. we will print as much money as we need to print. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so yes, that does reduce systemic risk in the short term. Mm -hmm. but, but between the U.S. and Europe, uh, you know, just taking a broad view of the market, where do you think we are post uh, the crisis now? Well, I don't think we're post-crisis in Europe at all. I think that we're right in the middle of the crisis in Europe. Okay. Uh, I mean, the U.S. is perhaps post-crisis. You've now got a rebound in housing. You've got you know, a number of rebounds. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think the whole fracking thing in the U.S. is actually starting to gather some real steam. Mm -hmm. And that probably will give a fairly decent boost to the U.S. economy over the next five, ten years. The other aspect of this year uh, that's really stood out is the way Japan as a trade has played out. Uh, you know, everybody was talking about Japan being the key trade for 2013, and it's played out exactly exactly the same way. The yen has weakened considerably. Yeah. Uh, the market has done really well year to date. Uh, uh, what's, what do you think is happening in Japan? Well, I think they've embarked on a very risky strategy of basically mm -hmm. trying to ignite inflation and basically trying to reflate the economy, mm -hmm. you know, through that. So, uh, so far it's worked in the mm -hmm. sense that basically they have weakened the yen. They have, you know, so I think people are enthusiastic about that. Mm -hmm. The problem is that what do you think the Koreans think about it? You know, about, so they're going to say, oh my God, we need to weaken our currency too because we're losing competitiveness. The Chinese are going to feel the same way. You know, yeah. my point is that it's a dangerous strategy because it can ignite a currency war mm -hmm. where everybody tries to kind of out devalue each other. Mm -hmm. So, hasn't one, that already started? You could say so. You could say so. But you could say that the, what the Japanese are doing is a very direct, you know, you know shot across the bows. Yeah. I don't know how it plays out, but the fact is that. There are, you know, there's some real risks from the strategy. But do you think there is still uh, some um, potential in that trade of, uh, of playing the stock market in Japan and uh, seeing more weakness in the yen? I think so. I mean, it seems certainly, certainly, you know. The up move I, I, is not over is what I'm trying to ask you. I, it, it would seem likely that it's not over. I, mm -hmm. I would think that this is going to keep going. Certainly they intend it to keep going now. Mm -hmm. Whether markets will agree with them or not, I don't know. But certainly if you ask the Japanese policymakers, do you want to weaken the land yen further from here, they would say yes. Yeah. Okay, you know, coming down to I emerging markets, uh, uh, do you think there's been a defined shift in playing the emerging market theme yes. uh, rather than investing directly in emerging market stocks, uh, invest in developed market companies which have EM exposure? We think that, uh, let me kind of redefine it a little bit. That is, we think that th rather than think of emerging markets as one monolithic block, we rather think of it as two blocks. One, which are the exporters and the commodity companies, or what one would think of as the globally sensitives, mm -hmm. and then what, what we think of as the locally sensitives, mm -hmm. the ones who serve domestic demand. Mm -hmm. So we think this domestic demand theme is actually a really big deal. Okay. So essentially, we... In, in, in the way that we approach this, we are agnostic as to what the domicile of the companies that serve that demand is. So we don't really care whether you're Unilever based in England or Holland, or if you're a company based in Bombay. What we care about essentially is who's serving that domestic demand, because we see that as a really big story for the next 20 years. So in your view, how are you looking at the DM versus EM uh, trade? You know, given that you run uh, a fairly big EM fund, how are you approaching the trade from a risk-adjusted return perspective? 
So we've actually got two funds now, one which specifically focuses just on this domestic consumption theme or domestic opportunities as we call it. Mm -hmm. So in that fund, we, as I said, we're agnostic about whether you're a multinational based in the US or whether you're a company based over here. So it turns out that right now, we have about 25% of that portfolio in multinational companies. Mm -hmm. So within that, we're typically buying what we think of as high quality, branded type companies, the ones who can take advantage of kind of the growth in the consumer sectors within emerging markets. Mm -hmm. In the broader fund, which kind of goes anywhere in emerging, there we focus much more so on what's really cheap now. So that, in that case, we like like Russian energy, which we, as I said, is really, really cheap. Mm -hmm. So things like that is where we have big bets on that. Mr. Devisha, let's uh, delve a bit more into the EM consumer theme that you spoke about. You know, you already have mm -hmm. a fund which is selectively identifying consumer uh, consumption-led opportunities. Um, there is, of course, much debate about, you know, uh, the consumption story being overvalued. How do you then look at uh, you know, picking uh, stocks which can give good returns? Sure, and we completely agree with that view, especially mm -hmm. if you look at some things like consumer staple stocks mm -hmm. in India, in China, and places like that. We certainly think those are all overvalued. They're trading at 30, 35 times earnings, so we don't see that as where the opportunity is. Mm -hmm. So the idea is we think that the broad theme is not just consumer companies, it's mm -hmm. consumption. So what are the supporters of consumption? It's consumer staples, but it's also consumer durables like cars. It's also financials, it's also telecoms, it's utilities. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that at different points in time, different things are more attractive. Mm -hmm. So right now, within the consumer staples theme, we find that the multinationals are a cheaper way of playing the same theme within emerging markets rather than the local stocks. Mm -hmm. So if you look at a number of companies that are based in the US or the UK, mm -hmm. you'll find that their subsidiaries in India are trading at 30, 35 times earnings, but the parent company is trading at maybe 16 times earnings. Mm -hmm. So we play that. Mm -hmm. But we also like, say, for example, the financials. Again, not specifically in India, but mm -hmm. across the globe, because financials tend to be the highest beta play mm -hmm. on this theme. The idea is that if a country is going to grow and people are going to get richer, mm -hmm. they're going to buy cars, they're going to buy apartments, mm -hmm. who benefits? It's the people who lend, the, lend them the money to do that. If you think that India is seeing a, a bit of a slowdown in its consumer story, then how do you, how do you view the deal that's just happened, the announcement of Unilever hiking its stake in Hindustan Unilever in India? Well, I mean, it's, it tells you something about the confidence that the Unilever management has mm -hmm. in the growth story in India from a long-term point of view. Because mm -hmm. after all, they're paying top dollar. I mean, the, you know, the local stock is not cheap. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you're buying it back not cheap tells you something about the confidence that they must, must have mm -hmm. about the Indian market in the long run. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, I see it as a confirmation of my theme mm -hmm. that basically consumption in emerging markets is going to be a big deal. Mm -hmm. Now, would I buy that back at 35 times earnings? No, I wouldn't. Okay. But hey, that's, that's me. Okay, which are the opportunities according to you in the EM world that you're most bullish on? So it turns out that it's the most economically sensitive ones like Russian oils, like Brazilian materials, like mm -hmm. Chinese banks, you mm -hmm. know, which are really, really cheap right now. The opportunity that's also coming up is, uh, you know, uh, playing the currencies and playing the debt market. How much sure. do you think uh, is uh, the differential trade there between uh, EM equities? Well, there has been a lot of interest in the, the local debt, you know, in, in emerging markets. Mm -hmm. And in some sense, part of our fear is that in places like India, there's actually been too much issuance of debt, you know. Mm -hmm. so, so we do have some fears about that. But in the long run, you know, as far as currencies are concerned, in the short term, there may be some vulnerability. Mm -hmm. uh, but my view about emerging currencies in the long run mm -hmm. is based on something that's known as the samuelson Balasa effect, okay. which basically says that in the long run, countries that have stronger economic growth mm. will have currencies that appreciate in real terms relative mm. to countries with slow economic growth. Mm. So as a dollar-based investor, mm. you should expect in the long run mm. that your investments in emerging markets are going to have currencies appreciate relative to the dollar. Mm. Now, that hasn't been true recently, obviously, mm. but in the long run, that's what I believe. Do so you see India falling in that bracket? Not in the short term. I think in the short term, there is potentially some vulnerability mm. in the currency, mm. although it's mitigated to some extent because of the gold price falling and the oil price falling. Exactly. So therefore, there's you know, a little bit of relief. Mm. But the fact is that India still has to fund this deficit. Mm. And at some level, it has been successful at attracting foreign capital to fund that deficit. My mm. fear is that tomorrow, if somehow foreigners start to dislike India, because mm. certainly foreigners have not given up on the India theme at all, mm. then in that case, you could have you know, some real pressure on the currencies if you have outflows of money from the equity markets, let's say. But how realistic would that be? Because foreigners are playing India 
because of the same themes that we've spoken about, the consumption theme, the growth of the com uh, economy showing on a relative basis? Well, I think that, you know, I think anybody who lives in this country knows how bad things actually are, okay? <laughs> it's not a big secret, mm -hmm. right? So sooner or later, people will figure that out. Okay. I mean, the analogy I like to give <laughs> is one of the golden goose. That is, if you go back to the, you know, 2003 to 2008, in many ways, I think India had this golden goose, which was laying these golden eggs. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, instead of feeding the golden goose to produce more eggs, mm -hmm. You know, the authorities essentially chose to cut open the golden goose and eat the eggs. <laughs> okay. So now they've got to grow a new goose. <laughs> so your strong underweight on India continues. It does, although valuations matter. And, you know, mm -hmm. so clearly there are sectors and stocks within India that we find attractive. Mm -hmm. So just because we don't like the economy doesn't mean we don't like all the stocks. Last time I spoke to you, you spoke about a corruption discount yes. that the Indian market deserves. Uh, well, we still haven't seen that. We still haven't seen. I mean, India is not what's a cheap... What's the theory right now? Well, India is not a cheap market. Uh -huh. Okay. And in fact, I would go far as to say that if you just look at it on broad parameters, like how much debt does the country have, what is the current account deficit, mm -hmm. what's the budget deficit, mm -hmm. Whereas for, for 50 years, Philippines was known as the sick man of Asia. I would say today India is the sick man of Asia. You are an investor in India. Yes. You are a selective investor in India. What would it take for you to increase allocations to the region? Well, valuations are the most important thing. You know, I mean, the interesting thing is that the Indian market has almost kind of become bifurcated. You have smaller and medium caps, which have actually become really, really cheap. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but they're very economically sensitive. You look at construction companies. You know, they have a lot of debt. They're not getting any contracts. They can't fund. You know, so there's a lot of vulnerability there, but to the extent that the economy starts to recover, mm -hmm. then, and you get infrastructure spending and things like that, then those things are really cheap. Mm -hmm. Whereas kind of the bigger, kind of more liquid, you know, international type stocks are not that cheap. Mm -hmm. So I could see, you know, if you started to see the economy recover, mm -hmm. I could see some of the cheap stuff becoming Do you see attractive. the economy recovering, given all the measures that have been taken on the reform front, whether it's from the central bank, the push to investment that's being made? Well, I'm hopeful that it will, but I, I can't say that we've seen it. I'd say the most hopeful thing that has happened is the fact that oil prices have fallen and gold prices have fallen, mm -hmm. and so has Aleve. Uh, you but know. what about the target that's being laid about, you know, from 5% growth, India could go to 6, 6.5% over 12 months, 18 months. Do you think that's, that's possible? It's certainly possible, but I'd like to see it happen. What do you expect from the market, uh, given the political scenario, over the next, let's say, two to three years? Well, I think what the market wants to see and what I want to see is some kind of stable government that can actually make policies. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that people perceive rightly or wrongly mm -hmm. that you're going to have continued instability after the election, mm -hmm. that you're not going to have a coalition that can actually govern, mm -hmm. then again, markets are not going to like that. Because uh, again, if, if I could just make one quick comment about, I spent a lot of time studying why are some countries rich and how some countries poor. Mm -hmm. And what I figured out the most important difference between rich and poor countries is that rich countries have been able to build the institutions that allow for sustained policy making over time. The poor countries are the ones who are very dependent on the government of the day doing a good job. So for example, for 16 years, Brazil had terrific government between Cardoso and Lula, they had 16 years of good government. Now, I don't believe the government is particularly good, which is why they're kind of dropping off the cliff. Mm -hmm. Conversely, if you look at the Philippines, which has been the sick man of Asia forever, currently, Aquino is a terrific president, and so they're doing really well. But tomorrow, when he's gone, who the heck knows? Mm -hmm. Similarly with India, we had five really good years. Well, you know, the policy stuff was really working. You know, you had the golden goose kind of phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Now you've had bad policy making. Mm -hmm. So my point is that what the markets want to see and what I want to see is consistency of policy making, good policy making which is sustained through time. So you think that the upcoming elections would be a, sort of a tipping point really for India in its uh, investment story? It could be or it could be more of the same. You could just have paralysis <laughs> which continues out after the election which would be a horrible scenario. But you'd be watching the elections very closely to take fresh call in India perhaps? Yeah, yeah of course. All right, on that note, Mr. Dvesha, thanks very much for taking out the time and speaking with us and sure. sharing your views. Thank you. With that, we come to the end of this edition of the FIIU. Thanks very much for watching.